I call a proponent at this time, Sue Levin. She's going to state the pro position on ballot measure 90. Good afternoon, thank you so much for having me, and uh, I'll do my own introduction. I'm fine, thank you. I am, uh, my name is Sue Levin. Uh, I live in Beaverton. I've lived here in Beaverton for about 20 years. Um, I'm a mother. I have two children in the Beaverton Public Schools. Uh, businesswoman, I started a company called uh, Lucy Clothing Company here in, in, in Oregon. Uh, I'm going to just be completely transparent. I am registered as a Democrat. Uh, I have um, pulled non-democratic lovers in my life, but probably the predominant lovers have been Ds. So I want to talk to you about why I support Measure 90. And I, uh, I'm also the, uh, the chair of the Oregon Advisory Board of Stand for Children, an education advocacy group. And I was, until recently, the executive director of that organization. Uh, but I'm here not representing Stand for Children. I'm here as an individual. That mic is a little bit hot. Um, in working at Stand uh, over the last uh, six years, I got an upfront view of the last three legislative cycles uh, in Salem uh, and the last three election cycles. Uh, Stand for Children is a 501c4 and a 501c3. We have a PAC. Uh, we participate in advocacy, political advocacy, on behalf of Oregon's public school children. We are a nonpartisan or bipartisan organization. Uh, the organization itself endorsement decisions are made by members. We're one of the few organizations in Oregon that regularly endorses both Republicans and Democrats. Typically, our Democratic endorsements are about two to one uh, over Republicans, in part because that's uh, been the political makeup of our legislature. In working with those Republicans and Democrats, so I've worked with leadership of the Republican Party in Oregon and the Democratic Party in Oregon. I have friends in leadership of both groups. But what became immediately apparent to me when I switched from just a regular citizen to working at the Capitol is that um, party leaderships and the, leadership, the leaders of small number of interest groups um, make a lot of decisions about who runs for office and then what positions they'll take once they get into office. Um, parties tend to be concerned, obviously there's big differences between the Republican and the Democratic Party, but when they get to Salem, I notice they have the same primary interest, which is getting a majority and keeping a majority. Um, and so when you get into the building, really what you hear, less than R&D is majority and minority. Who's a majority, who's a minority? At one point, um, Stanford Children, as an education group, was even more supportive of Democratic candidates than Republican candidates. This was back in the beginning of the 1990s, or rather, the beginning of early 2000s, uh, because the Democrats Made, made this argument that if we controlled everything, we would spend more on education. In fact, what happened when we had Democratic supermajorities and Democratic governor and Ted Kulandagoski is that actually education spending didn't increase um, because it's a lot more complicated than that, right? Uh, how much we have to spend on education, health and human services is a very complicated calculus between revenues that we collect and revenues impact tax policy and expenditures on health and human services, public safety, and education. I am convinced that the only way that Oregon as a state can get past or can solve that larger problem of how do we best collect revenues and expend those revenues, that that requires bipartisan solutions. And Oregon has a long history of that. Um, many of you have probably lived here longer than I do, and you know that this state has roots uh, in bipartisan leadership and moderate Republican leadership, you know, Governor Tia, and, and many, many more. So I didn't come here to teach a history lesson. Um, so the most productive session that I observed recently was when we had a 30-30 split in the House and the Senate, and uh, in the House, rather, and both parties had to compete uh, with each other for ideas. And moderate Republicans joined forces with Democrats, and moderate Democrats joined forces with Republicans. That also happened in the grand bargain in the last session. What happens when those elected officials cross party lines, their biggest fear is the threat of a primary election, right? 
If you want to see fear in the eyes of a legislator, talk to them about getting primary, because in a primary, a very small number of more partisan voters are going to tend to look down on you for crossing party lines to vote. And let me give you a very specific example. This isn't a primary. Uh, this is an example of someone getting primary, but it shows what happens in a primary election. Right here in, in Washington County, in House District 34, Ken Helm recently won the Democratic primary with 7% of the vote. And he is virtually unopposed in the general election because House District 34 skews so heavily Democratic. So 7% of the vote in a Democratic primary picked our state representative in House District 34. That's not a knock on Ken, but that tells me that something's wrong with the system. Here's a couple of other things that really trouble me in the system in terms of numbers. 700,000 Oregonians can't participate in primary elections because they're not registered. And the number of uh, new voters registering for neither the Democrat or Republican Party is exploding. It's gone from 20% to 50% to, in the last numbers reported by the Secretary of State just a month ago, 80% of people who registered to vote chose neither the Democrat nor Republican Party. They registered as independent. Those folks can't vote in primaries. So it's not a partisan issue, okay? The Republicans and Democrats are losing out equally, and Republicans and Democrats get primary equally. Uh, Betsy Johnson has become a big target in the Democratic Party because she's broken ranks. Vic Gilliam, on the right, got primary by Republican for taking, for taking what I think are relatively common sense positions on issues like gay, uh, gay marriage and immigration reform. Um, I guess the last thing that I'll say, I'm getting close to my time, the last thing that I'll say is that Oregon is not a hyper-partisan state right now. Uh, we've had good bipartisan effort in Salem uh, with the governor. We had that 30-30 session. I, and I think that a lot of people use that as a reason to say, well, we don't need to elect more moderate candidates. We don't need to come to the middle. I fear that we are at a point where that is changing and that if Measure 90 doesn't pass this time in two years, we're going to wish that we did. The politics around issues, particularly around issues like immigration and tax reform, are about to become more hyperpartisan. Um, and our ability to solve the complex problems that I mentioned earlier, like public safety, another great example. We want more money for schools, we should spend more money for prison, on prison, less money on prisons, rather. If you, want to ask a if you want to see a Democratic politician go white, ask them to take a public safety vote, because you'll get hammered on that issue, right? So we can't ask politicians to take tough votes if we're sending them out into an election cycle where a small minority of people get to decide whether they get to keep their seat. Um, so thank you very much for, for, for your attention. I'm, I'm going to come back and answer questions, or do I answer them now? You'll get two minutes of rebuttal after Sarah Lowe speaks, and then the question will come. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all right. I'm kind of scared to touch the mic. Okay. Hi there. Um, my name is Sarah Logue. I am actually a fifth grade teacher in Forest Grove. I'm on a year leave of absence this year to have a few adventures, including spending some quality time with the No on 90 folks. When I first heard about Measure 90, I was actually researching on my computer how to repaint my cabinets as a summer project. And there was a little pop-up that came up and talked about top two and how it was going to change everything. And I thought, this is fabulous. Actually, this is a really good idea. Why aren't we doing this? So I did a little more research and I found out it actually wasn't what I thought it was. Um, and I felt a little bit tricked. And so I got involved with the No on 90 campaign. And before I knew it, I was the spokesperson for the No on 90 campaign. It's interesting how those things happen. Um, so the basic overview of top two is that it would change our election system. So anyone regardless of party could vote for any candidate regardless of party, but only the top two vote getters in the primary move forward onto the general election. What that means is that our choices are greatly limited on the general election. Um, when you look at who actually votes in primaries in Oregon, it's pretty stark. Um, it's a less diverse 95% Caucasian population that is uh, more partisan and usually wealthier. It's not a very diverse crowd. In fact, in Oregon, our 16 over population is about a quarter of our voting population, but they represent 
58% of the primary vote, so more than half of the primary vote. We know that our younger voters and our more diverse voters are not engaged in the primary election. And a top two system takes that control over who we can vote for and shifts it to the primary, to this group of, of citizens who um, would then be able to uh, limit our choices in the general election to only two. Um, looking at other examples of limiting choice, I would look at Washington Congressional District 4. If you may, you may know that Washington State and California State actually are both top two states currently, that is their primary election system. In Washington Congressional District 4, there are two candidates, Mr. Dieter and Mr. Newhouse, um, and it is a conservative district. Both of those folks are, are conservative. One is a little more Tea Party flavor, um, and the other one is a former Monsanto spokesperson. But for the 80,000 people who voted in that district democratically in 2012, they have no one on their general election ballot that has the same choices or views as themselves. So they're left with choosing someone who they don't feel resonates with their, their choices and their, um, their values or not voting at all. And what we are seeing is that people are disengaging and voter turnout is down. It's down nationwide, but it's also down in top two states. And that's one of the main points that proponents in Washington and California, when they were trying to pass the measures there, um, shared is that it was going to increase voter turnout in the primaries because it makes the primary vote so much more important than it already is. But it hasn't happened there. And I have little hope that it would happen here. Um, when a minority of the population has the majority of the influence over who we can vote for, it's a bad sign for our democracy. The second reason I oppose Measure 90 is who is actually behind the measure. Um, Sue actually spoke about special interest groups, and in my opinion, the proponents of Measure 90 represent a very narrow group of special interests themselves. Millionaires, corporate groups, um, CEOs, two out-of-state billionaires, one of which is Mr. John Arnold, who has recently contributed $1.5 million dollars. Um, John Arnold, if you don't recognize his name, um, earned a lot of his money in the Enron scandal. Um, he's a billionaire from Texas. Um, so business groups see this as a way to elect more business-friendly candidates more easily. Portland City Club in 2008, when we fought this measure before as Measure 65, um, Portland City Club did a study and they found that the top two system is actually designed to create a certain style of candidate. Anytime we've changed our political system to create a specific outcome, we've damaged our democracy and silenced the voices of the representative people. Our coalition at No. 90, the Protect Our Vote Coalition, represents hundreds and thousands of Oregonians and their values. Um, we include, yes, the major parties, but also several minor parties and several advocacy groups and small business groups, including Pacoon and Apano, the Pacific Green Party, the Progressive Party, and many, many others. Um, Measure 90 doesn't s solve the problems it sets out to, and in fact, it creates a host of new problems. The last thing I'd like to talk with you about um, at this moment are the flaws inside of Measure 90. I actually have a handout on the back if you'd like to learn more about just the facts and the, the flaws included in Measure 90. The flaws are signed off on by several attorneys and lawyers in Oregon who've read the measure and are concerned about its outcomes. Um, just There are many flaws, but I'll just talk really quickly about two um, for the sake of time. One is that write-ins would not count on the general election. So knowing that the top two move forward and that you wouldn't be allowed to write in a candidate if you were displeased with the options you were given really makes me pause. Um, I know that as a young voter, if I was displeased with the candidates I had to select from, I might vote for Mickey Mouse or my mom. Um, but to not have that ability to voice your displeasure with the given candidates is really a very stark contrast to our current system. The second is that co county commissions would be able to appoint for vacancies without regards to party. So in the majority commission um, in Washington County being majority Republican and our seats filled with, with Democrats, if a Democrat had to stand down, the commission could then, uh, could then appoint anyone for any reason, regardless of um, the party that the voters have, had chosen to fill that seat with, which I just feel is disrespectful to the voters. So in closing, Measure 90 limits choice on the general election. It is put on the ballot by special interest groups, including out-of-state billionaires, and it is very fatally flawed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, and I think it's terrific that you're taking a year off and per participating in the, the political process. I think that's great. And, and thanks to you for being here. Uh, just a couple things I'll, sp I'll specify or elaborate on further. So 
A couple of your comments spoke to the, to the point of who gets to choose. And I think in that we both agree. We want, we want more people choosing who represents us in Oregon. I will just explain that in, this, in, this, in the system that we have right now, 90% of elections in Oregon are not competitive, purely on the basis of the, demogra the underlying demographics of the district. So in 90% of the, of the electoral districts in Oregon for the state senate, in the state house, if you win the primary, you have a 99.9% .9 chance of winning the seat. Back to the Ken Helm example. So 7% of people got to choose. If instead we had had a top two runoff in, our, in Washington County, here for House District 34, and Ken and the second highest vote getter, who also probably would have been a Democrat, we would have probably had two Democrats running against each other, but we would have had two guys who had different positions on the issue, and we would have been able to have more voters make a choice. Uh, in terms of who is behind this statute, this uh, Measure 90 was written by Phil Kiesling. Does anybody remember Phil? Mm -hmm. Phil, former Secretary of State of the State of Oregon, a very good friend of mine, a man that I'm proud to call a friend, uh, a Democrat, but a, a fantastic bipartisan leader. Uh, that's who wrote this legislation. Uh, it's supported by former governors, attorney generals, uh, state senators, senators. You can go back and look at the... the the, the paper and look at the who's on the, the list uh, of supporters. Uh, independent voters and, and small party voters, the two largest small or two large small parties in Oregon, the Independent Party and the Working Families Party, which constitute 115,000 of 150,000 independent uh, minor party voters, sorry, the majority of minor party voters support this measure. By the way, we have not elected a minor party candidate to any office in the state of Oregon since 1974. So the current system's not working really well for minor parties. Um, and then the, the point about county commissions that Sarah made is a good point. That is one situation where Republican county commissioners could uh, choose the replacement. I would argue that a situation in which one to five percent of uh, seats are determined by a position by a in a, in a process that's less fair is better than what we have right now, which is that 90% are divided, decided in a process that's not fair. Um, and if you want to get into arcane local pol political party process, you'll know that any legislator who stands down will effectively be reappointed by the county, that his successor will effectively be approved by the county commission. Um, I think that addresses most, of, oh, one last point on, um, Voters of color and minority representation. In California, uh, the number of Hispanic representatives to the legislature increased from 9 to 12 after the shift to uh, top two voting. And in fact, um, perhaps more than any other group, uh, Latinos and immigrants, I think, stand to benefit from Measure 90 in Oregon because Republicans have been so vulnerable on immigration issues. They've been taking any immigration vows uh, and, and pledges um, and that makes them vulnerable in primaries to challenges on immigration issues. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, I think that we both, as you uh, mentioned before, agree that we want more people to choose um, and be involved in our election system. Sadly, the data just doesn't show that in top two states. Um, people are not more engaged with, than they were previously before top two. Um, as far as competitive races, we actually looked at the data from Washington and a, a top two state and Oregon in races and competitiveness. Um, there was no difference percentage-wise between competitive races, and we qualified competitive races as um, final results being less than 10% uh, difference. Um, and I would be happy to share that data with you. Um, while um, Phil Kiesling, I'm not sure who wrote it, I wasn't there. I've met Phil, he's a great guy. Um, but Jim Kelly is the listed chief petitioner, and I spoke earlier about proponents of the measure, not who's writing it. Um, also, um, the, as far as the California representatives going from 9 to 12 in minority representation, that's wonderful news. And I would actually rethink my position on top two if that, uh, that result could be actually attributed to the top two change. But the truth is that in California, for that change to happen, there was redistricting during that time. So it's really important to look at the whole perspective. I think that's wonderful news and wonderful progress for our nation, um, but it cannot be attributed to the top two change. So it's really important to, um, to make sure you look at the whole picture. 
As far as minor parties, it's really important in Oregon. I know we have a rich culture of our minor parties and our third parties being a part of our conversation. And I've had many conversations with the proponents about the role of minor parties. And I've heard again and again, minor parties don't win, minor parties don't win. And for me, it may sound interesting, but in politics, it may not be all about winning. A lot of times it's about our conversations that we have. And as a nation, the when we've come and progressed on issues, a lot of the conversations that have helped us to progress are conversations that our minor parties have started. Um, one is marriage equality. That was a minor party issue before it was a major party issue. Um, so I think that to cut our minor parties out of our general election conversations by allowing only two candidates in the, gen in the general election, and most frequently those candidates would be for major parties, I think it, it does narrow our conversations also. And um, we can definitely still learn from our minor parties. Our minor party candidates are candidates that represent voices and values of our Oregon citizens. And to limit those out of our general election, I feel is wrong. Thank you. Both of our speakers are very persuasive. I'm glad they weren't selling me insurance. I'd probably buy both products. Um, um, so the questioning is open to the members of the forum. Um, uh, we haven't needed you know, the heavy fascist hand of the moderator to limit any questions. So I'm going to assume that from what I've seen of these two folks, they can handle the questions. And we'll assume they're both, both persons unless um, they're directed at one or the other. So we know the drill. We introduce ourselves. We have a succinct question limited to one issue. If there's, we want follow-up, we go back to the end of the line, and if there's time, because we're at, at 15 till, Myra Martinez is coming on to measure 88. Thank you. My name is Bill Kroger. I'm a forum member. Uh, the way our system works right now is we have opponents in each party running against each other, and then it comes to the primary election, and then you have one from each party running. So it's kind of a new election in a way, and it can generate more interest. Uh, the, if this thing, if some Nurture 90 passes, um, you could end up with the same two people, for example, in the Democrats, which would happen in a lot of districts, I think, in Oregon. The same two people who have been debating the issue for a number of months will now continue to debate it for a few more months. You know, there's nothing more ho-hum, uh, you know, than just this whole election continuing that long. And I was just kind of curious that it seems to me it would turn off more people than it would benefit them. I think it gets to the heart of what I think is interesting about this system. In the Democratic primary, both people want to take the same positions on every issue uh, because they're talking to the same folks. So if you're in a Democratic primary, your first, and, and believe me, I've seen this, and you probably saw it in your mailboxes, the first mailer you got was on reproductive rights because we want to show that we're good with women. The second one is going to be on uh, education because we want to show that we're good on education, and the third one is going to be on the environment, and we don't distinguish ourselves. The two Democratic candidates will take almost entirely, will take very similar positions, because they're playing to the same audience. When you open, take those same two people, and say now you're talking to all the electorate in your district, including people who maybe are less monolithic in their opinions on those issues, a very different discussion has to take place. And that actually is the thing that most interests me about this is that people will get out of these canned part, uh, primary uh, campaigns that have been poll tested. If you want to get, you know, if you want to get uh, the, the, the Democratic faithful, just say Monsanto, because that gets them, you know, get Zay Koch brothers, because that gets them. You know, let's actually go and talk on a more nuanced level to a broader a swath of voters. That's my interest. Thank you for the question, Bill. Um, the sad thing is that the top two primary just hasn't generated more interest in the states that it's been tried in. Um, and as far as same party races, that could be this, this new status quo if Measure 90 were to pass. Um, the problem with sta same party races is that it disengages so much of the population um, instead of having a broad variety of choice that, that I spoke on before. Thanks. Hi, this is primarily a message for Sue. I'm Karen Packer, former member. Hi, Sue. <laughs> uh, and uh, as you know, um, I've been working in politics for a long time. And it is my firm belief that instead of uh, our legislators, let's take that's the example used most, um, doing it to play to a certain audience, I tend to believe that Republicans support Republican values Democrats support re democratic values in the sense, and here's my question, 
uh, if we have an open top two primary, what is to prevent the kinds of abuses that we've seen happen in other states? And I mentioned Eric Cantor's race uh, at last in the last primary, where you have crossover voting. And so you could take uh, a district that might have democratic values, and all of a sudden, you have candidates in there that do not reflect the values of the people. How do you, how do you propose in a top two sy uh, system of primaries that you would um, eliminate or at least cut down on those kinds of abuses because they clearly happen. First of all, Karen, thank you. And if, if someone was going to go across the street and teach a civics lesson at, at Mountain View High School, it would be you, not me. So I'm, I'm not going to debate those, the nuances with you. Um, <laughs> no, but, but I will say this. Um, you, you can't have both arguments, and so I hear the I hear the opponents saying what uh, what Sarah's saying, which is that nothing has changed, and then I hear the opponents saying at, at the other end of the spectrum that everything is going to change, and that somehow folks are going to hijack a, a seat. W what I see happening more in Oregon, if you believe that Republicans support Republican values and Democrats support Democrat values, what I see in Oregon happening is that. Um, moderate Republicans and moderate Democrats are becoming, are hunted, right? And, and if you look at Frank Morse, uh, who's no longer in the legislature, and he wasn't voted out, but he, he left because of the, 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 the difficulty in working within a Republican party that was being hijacked, he felt, by an extreme. And then you look at Vic Gilliam, who took tough votes on immigration issues that were important to nurserymen. I mean, the nurserymen are so divided right now because they are trying to support their workers and their business, and they're getting called for being, you know, pro-immigrant, pro-illegal. Um, and, and Democrats who do choose to take nuanced positions on issues of the environment or labor get targeted. And so that's my concern that's very much right now as opposed to a hypothetical what could happen. That's my best answer. You have no game plan on abuses might, that might occur. I would, I would count on the good people in, in both of the parties uh, and the Secretary of State's office in Oregon to respond to uh, hypothetical abuses that have not so far emerged in Washington, California, or any of the other 36 states that have some version of more open primaries than ours. Ours are, depending on who you talk to, in the, in the bottom 20% of openness for primaries nationwide. Thank you for the question, Karen. Um, as far as what is to prevent the abuse of the system, I think that is a concern. Um, Operation Chaos from just a few years ago at the presidential primary um, from, um, oh, I forgot to say, Rush Limbaugh is one idea that would could be you know commonplace given um, a top two system. Um, as far as no change that um, Sue mentioned before, I'm not saying there hasn't been any change in top two states. I'm saying there hasn't been any increase in turnout. That's not to say there hasn't been change. Um, as far as examples of you know, disproportionate results based on the population, California District 31 comes to mind. Um, a few years ago in California District 31, which is a predominantly Democratic district, uh, there was an open seat and six candidates ran. Four candidates were Democratic and two were Republicans. And what happened in that district is that the four Democratic candidates actually split the vote, and both Republican candidates went forward into the general election as, as a top two system in California. And when I spoke with Jim Kelly, the chief petitioner of Measure 90, about this, he said, well, that's just the system. It needs to self-correct, and it did self-correct the following cycle. The facts are that same outcome was 0.4 percent, four tenths of a percent away from happening again in the next election cycle. What we also know is that in Washington state, party leaders are actually, we, I have a quote um, from a Washington uh, political party leader um, that I can I furnish you with that says he's actually having to go and discourage candidates from running to keep the vote from being split in the primary and to kind of help the system along for the results they would like in the general election. I don't want to discourage people from running in our election system. I think that's not beneficial to our democracy. Thanks for the question. Hi, I'm Linda Barney, forum member. And I'm, uh, this is, question is for both of you. I'm curious on how you think Measure 90 will impact uh, independent voters, pro and con. So, so I, 
just want to come back to, to one thing real quick. So, and I, two things real quick. I don't know about the Washington, the specific example, but, but if we were in a position where we were having to discourage people from running, I would think that would be fantastic because we had 50% of races, open seats where no one filed in this state. We have a hard time finding anyone to run for office in significant numbers of open seats in Oregon. The second thing I just want to say about my friend Jim Kelly, uh, since Sarah's mentioned him a couple times, I don't know if you guys know the Kelly family, Neil Kelly, that's Jim's family. Uh, they've been business leaders and civic leaders in our state uh, for decades. Um, and, and Jim's a great man. He's a uh, started uh, uh, restoration hardware and uh, is now a rancher in Eastern Oregon. Um, so your question, in terms of independent voters, the Independent Party of Oregon has endorsed Measure 90 um, because there actually are a, a large and growing number of independent voters who could actually have a significant role in a top two primary. And I think a lot of people uh, also are independent because um, they, they are not drawn to the hyper-partisan extreme of either party and so would be more likely to, um, to like the kind of moderate candidates uh, and I'm very upfront about this. This top two system is an attempt to put more moderate candidates in front of voters or, to, or to at least ask candidates to stake out positions that can appeal to a broader swath of the voting public. Thanks for your question, Linda. Um, as far as the effects of independent voters uh, under Measure 90, it's interesting to look at the independent party because their leadership is actually split on this issue. Um, one of my friends, Dan Meek, is the co-founder of the independent party, um, and he is on, has endorsed the no on 90 position. Now, what Sue said is true. The independent party of Oregon has come out in favor of Measure 90. They did a survey of, I believe it was 300 members of the independent party, and based on those results, they did endorse, and that's their process. I can't speak specifically to their process because I'm not an you know, independent party member. Um, but as far as um, in the results of Measure 90 on independent party, um, voters, I, I think that the independent party would say, if they were here to speak for themselves, they have their own process currently to promote candidates to the general election, and it would alter their process as well. Um, also, my friend Dan Meek shared recently that the independent party is very close to becoming the next major party in Oregon. Um, I forgot the number, but I think it's only 4,000 more registered voters they need to have the major party status. They are the party leadership, as far as they are, you know, in different views on Measure 90, they do share the same view that once they are the next major party in Oregon, they plan to open their primary system so all non-affiliated voters could, could participate in their process. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Lois O'Brien, and there's a couple of points that affect our elections. And one, our last three secretaries of state have not worked for us in this issue. Uh, in 2010, Kate Brown instructed the major largest counties to ignore the election laws about destroying unused ballots, and they were not destroyed until June the following year. Uh, the one before her, Bill Bradbury, um, went to Woodburn to encourage illegals to vote. Uh, we've had fighting against an honest election in a long time. Every time I go to talk at Salem before the committees. Kate Brown is there trying to get rid of another one of our protective laws um, that protect our vote. And so what can we... Question pretty quick. Well, I have two minutes, don't I? Uh, no, actually, uh, more succinct than that. Oh, less than two minutes? Yeah, because they have put them on Oh, I'm sorry. One minute, is that it? As brief as possible. How do you think we can have any honest election, whether it's open or not, when we are prevented by the leaders in our state. Thank you for your question, and, and I think that uh, the, best, the best medicine for, for democracy, uh, any democracy with a small d, is daylight. More people participating in elections is a positive. Uh, and uh, the the idea that independent, uh, that top two primaries haven't increased turnout in a time where we're seeing all-time lows in turnout, right? So this past spring was an all-time low for Oregon in turnout. And we know that we've got 700,000 people who can't participate in primaries. And we have a, a sensible rule change that allows those people to participate. 
my belief is that not statewide, but district by district, it will make certain races more competitive and certain people more likely to vote. And I think that's um, that's the best way to preserve uh, to preserve our democracy. I do want to follow up too, just on a, a point that you made, Sarah. Maybe you can address it. And now I have a question: If the independent party is planning, if it becomes a major party, to have open primaries, then would that not be another piece of evidence that open primaries are a positive? You can, you can address that question for me, thanks. <laughs> You bring up a really important point, Sue, is that um, a true open primary is very, very different from what the top two system does create. So that's an important distinction um, to research. Um, as far as Lois's question, um, Lois, thank you for your question. Um, I know that we have had struggles with our system, and I'll be the first to admit that I'm frustrated with our political system. But the sad thing is that Measure 90 actually creates a host of problems that our current system doesn't have, and it doesn't solve the problems that we currently have. Um, so it, I wouldn't want people to jump to the first option, hoping that it's a solution, and coming away with a, a system that's even messier than our current system. Um, I think there are lots of things we can do to, to, to increase voter turnout and to improve our system, including same-day voter registration, automatic voter update, all of those um, items are, are wonderful and I hope would increase our democracy and increase turnout. Um, we were you know, one vote away from several of those um, changes happening in the last legislative ses session and several of the proponents of Measure 90 actually uh, were against that process. Um, as far as uh, the Secretary of State not you know, cooperating on certain issues, the one that comes to mind for me is when the Republican Party tried to open their primary um, to voters, and uh, Kate Brown, I believe it was, did not send ballots to those non-affiliated voters, just a postcard saying that they could request ballots. So we do have a lot of work to do to improve our system, but in my opinion, Measure 90 does not solve the problems that we're facing. Short questions, short answers, three more people, six minutes. Harry Bodine, forum member. I grew up in Texas in the 1940s, and I remember a closed primary system down there. And the whole purpose of the closed primary was the people who were running it would be able to control the nominations. We have a situation in Oregon, it seems to me, where both parties are now captive to a small minority, a, a pressure interest groups within their ranks. On the Democratic side, it's the labor unions, the public employees, the OEA. Republicans, you've got your Tea Party, whatever out there, you know. So, what happens if you open this thing up so that the special interest group is, power is reduced in an overall election where anybody can run and just, uh, and also appeal to all the voters, including the 700,000 who are now locked out of a, a closed gate primary system? You make my remarks, actually, but uh, I, I agree with you 100%. And, and I said to a friend of mine who's very active in the Democratic Party in Clackamas County, and she's a, she's a big D Democrat, and she's someone I admire and respect. I had this conversation with her, and she said, you know, um, a good friend of hers, a man who's been involved, civically engaged, came to her recently and said, you know, uh, I heard that our representative is, is stepping down. I'm thinking of throwing my hat in for his seat. And she laughed. Because this is a good man who's been civically engaged, would be a great representative, but he wasn't part of the, you know, the party establishment and his, he wasn't, he had no chance of getting that nomination. That nomination was going to be determined by folks who are, you know, the power brokers. They're not, I'm not saying they're bad folks, um, but there, there is, um, there are a smaller number of people who control uh, how the process happens and, and that works for them. I would just say, go look at your ballot pamphlet statement and look at who's in support of Measure 90. Um, these are not bad people. These are people with whom I agree on many interests, on many issues, but it is a list of the people who currently have power and control over the system in the way that it is designed. Uh, I think when I saw that, more than anything else, it confirmed for me that people are protecting a system because they know how to work that system, and that opening up the system makes it easier for new folks to enter. Thank you for your question. Um, as far as a top two system and people gaming that, um, in my mind, big money becomes the winning ticket in a top two system because name recognition becomes the most important part 
of a primary election. With so many candidates on a ballot, um, if you recognize a name and you've seen some positive advertisement, I can, I can see a lot of political sway happening because of that. The other issue brought up is um, party endorsements. And, uh, so in, under a top two system, um, party endorsements would be the new status quo instead of our nomination process. Currently we nominate within the parties during the primary and all of our voters participate in that. I believe the reform for that was in 1905 um, to make that a, a public process with, within the primaries. Um, and that would change. Party leads c would be able to make those decisions in the proverbial smoke-filled rooms without the party members weighing in on that process. The process becomes an endorsement process instead of a nominating process, and those endorsements are granted based on the opinions of party leads instead of the public. So I think it's a big step back for Oregon. Uh, Lee Coleman, uh, forum member. As I understand the theory of uh, behind general elections is to present the, a true choice for voters of op opposing political philosophies. Why would we want a measure on the books in Oregon that has a great potential for creating no choice of political philosophy? So the, the situation that you describe in which you have a Democrat and a Republican running for a contested seat with very different ideologies happens in Oregon over the last, I don't know how many election cycles, in less than 10, less than 7% of seats. I can tell you. Why would we want that kind of system which I described? Right. Oh, why would we that, want no choice? That, that is the question that I'm, that I'm that is the question. endeavoring to answer. Uh, so so uh, right now those seats tend to be in Hillsborough and in Clackamas. Hillsborough and Clackamas, and a lot of money gets spent on those seats uh, because that's the place where voters actually do have a choice and where people spend a lot of money trying to influence people's votes. Um, I don't think that Measure 90 would magically transform us to a situation where more races become competitive, um, but I believe that in Washington, California, the general trend has been, or the general case has been, that you have more situations where you get to a general election and you have two candidates with different views actually competing for the vote of the entire electorate. Thanks, Lee, for your question. I'll try to be quick so we have time for the final question. Um, I agree with you. I want choice in the general election ballot. I think that in Oregon, I don't necessarily feel the same way politically than my parents or my cousins or my friends, and that's okay. And we can have a rich discussion in the general election about a variety of choices, and all of us can have expanded horizons to understand each other if there's multiple choices on the ballot. Thank you. Mark Driver, forum member. We have seconds left, but Sarah, if you succeed, what will you do to help improve turnout? Same question to you. If you succeed, what will you get to help actually urge people to come to the polls so they don't end up saying, like in Washington, turnout didn't increase? Thanks for your question. I think, again, um, I talked about other ways to improve turnout. Um, I think the get out the vote effort and voter registration among young people is really important. Um, I, I think that's one of the best things we can do. But as a system, things I spoke about earlier, automatic voter, voter registration, automatic voter update, those are all positive changes for our system. So I, I have to correlate turnout to the fact that a decreasing percentage of young voters are choosing either Democrat or Republican Party. I think what they're saying is that the ideas of the two parties that currently have control of our political system are not interesting to me. The dialogue that they're having is not interesting. I think people are craving something that is more bipartisan, more solution-oriented, and more focused on real problems instead of um, sort of hyper-partisan, our party's better than their party. So I'm hoping that ideas will actually bring people back into the political process. Another outstanding presentation of issues. Sarah Logue and Sue Levin, thank you for coming. Um, it's uh, remarkable that the ways in which things can be explained such that you come in with a fixed view and all of a sudden it's not so fixed. Um, Measure 88 folks were here um, last time and uh, we made some efforts, um, fruitless, uh, uh, to get the other side here. So Myra Martinez from uh, the uh, Measure 88 folks are going to be here. She's going to take um, five
five to eight minutes or, or more to explain it, or she can take all 15. But if you want questions, we're going to fit it into one hour. So I'll let her introduce herself. Um, and the board made this decision based upon equity, and um, and the forum members contacted us too. So, Myra Martinez. The struggle of being so short. Hold the mic for a second. Thank you. Perfect. Go for it. Well, thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm very, very pleased to see a great group of beautiful people. Um, I'm going to give a little background of who I am because I feel like that's very important, especially um, in terms of Yes on Me Measure 88. Um, I grew up, I was born in Mexico. My family migrated when I was three, um, back, in uh, back in 1996. Um, we moved to a farm on Tile Flat Road, and to this day, we still live there. With that said, um, I was opened up to a beautiful new world um, uh, with terms of this beautiful woman named Leslie Beerley who gave me the chance to, to succeed in life. She gave me the opportunity to, to ride horses and that's where my passion of horses came in. And I feel like once you get a grasp of passion, then you succeed. Um, with that said, when I was a younger person, before I started riding, I was trouble. I was trouble everywhere. Didn't like school. Was in the principal's office every day. Um, but Leslie was like, if you want to ride, you have to get good grades and you have to stay out of trouble. Um, with that said, it was really hard. It was really hard to change from being trouble to being a great student, and that's what I did. Um, after that, it's been a wrap. I got a scholarship to go to Portland State University. I'm there. I'm proceeding a degree in mathematics. I'm hoping to be an engineer, be part of this, uh, contribute to Oregon society, um, and make changes because we definitely need them. With that said, Measure 88, um, it's just the common sense, you know, solution to what the problem is. It's, the problem is we're having folks who know that driving is definitely a necessity. That's how we get everywhere. Especially for me that, you know, I live out in the country and I can't just walk to the bus, right? It's just a couple miles away and, and it's rainy season and, you know, drivers are out there kind of scary and, you know, there isn't any sidewalk. So with that said, you know, this measure is going to provide that opportunity to be eligible to drive legally. You know, we have to get tested. We have to make sure that we're eligible to, uh, to drive and be uh, eligible to purchase insurance and be part of this community. Because in 2008, they took us out of this community. And I'm talking about not just the undocumented folks, because yes, that's the biggest group that is affected, but I'm talking about uh, seniors, I'm talking about homeless folks, I'm talking about transgender folks, um, I'm also talking about uh, Military folks who can't, you know, using their ID, military ID, can't get a driver's license. So there's a huge problem with this, and I feel like this is definitely the solution. And, and for Oregon to continue to strive for greatness, I feel like this is definitely a great way to get equity, you know, because we want Oregon to be known to be like, yeah, that's the state that, you know, we can definitely strive to do good things. And... They treat everyone equally because at the end of the day, we're all equal, you know? So with that said, that's a quick spiel. I'm definitely up for questions because I'm sure a lot of people are anxious to ask questions. We are a nation of laws. And to make exceptions of, on this grand scale is not good. Um, I was wondering, I've seen the groups that are so united and strong in favor of what you are wanting. And I wonder why in Mexico, where they have so many, uh, so much wealth and uh, great wealth and resources, but their political thing is not so good. Why are not all these people that have come to America illegally, why are they not on the, on the front steps of the capital in Mexico demanding change in their own country? 
That's a great question. And um, I'm going to pull this out because I've noticed it. When we think of immigration, we think of Mexicans. Well, I think the, there, there is, um, but why do we have to decide that it's Mexicans? There's obviously Canadians that come down, and we don't make a big issue about that. With that said, Mexico, yeah, might have these great, beautiful sites that has um, beautiful stuff, but at the end of the day, why do we keep on coming over here? Because this, this, and again, this, I don't want to get into immigrant stuff because this, doesn't have to do with immigration. We know that at a national level, the immigration system is messed up. We all can agree to that. But we're talking about public safety, and this is what this measure is about. And excuse me, I might not be able to answer your question, because again, it doesn't have to do with anything about Measure 88. It's all about that, the illegals that are voting, wanting uh, everything, because when you get your driver's license, you get to go on airplanes, you get to vote. Actually, I'm going to let you answer that question if you, if you want, otherwise. Of course, yeah. It comes down to, uh, we can't board a plane. You know, this driver card is only just to drive. No, we PSA, can't get PSA onto a plane. We, a plane. PSA has said yes. We cannot get onto a plane. The, when, we, when we pitched for this, it's, it, they said these are the restrictions. You cannot get on a plane. You cannot vote, and you can only use it to drive. Point blank. That, that is it. We can only use it to drive and purchase insurance, of course. Uh, Myra, I want, first want to thank you. My name is Eric Squires. I'm a forum member, and I personally have voted yes on 88, but there's one caveat, and I'd like to uh, see if you have a response for this. Two people, one being undocumented, one being documented, both being equal going to buy insurance. The undocumented person is not likely to have their insurance scored and priced in the same way because their social security number is not brought in. In Oregon, we allow your credit to factor the insurance. So you use the term equity repeatedly in your presentation, and I thank you for that. The inequity that I see on a yes on 88 vote is that someone who purchases insurance without a social security number could arguably uh, pay a lower rate than someone who is not otherwise compliant and provides a social security number. So there's a disequity. Someone who's here without documentation could pay less for their insurance than someone who is documented. Has that popped up in discussions? Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, no, but I could definitely use my parents as a great example. They pay the same rates as the rest of us do. And I've actually never even heard of that, but that's definitely, I'm going to take note of it and maybe do some more investigation. Because that is definitely inequity, you know, that's not equal. We shouldn't be treated differently, you know, definitely. Thank you. Lee Coleman, forum member. As I understand the opposition to uh, driver's card is that uh, those people are immigrants and uh, illegal and uh, therefore they have no right to any status. What happens to uh, an undocumented alien who's uh, picked up by the police driving uh, without uh, any license or permission to drive, uh, and why would we want to perpetuate a system like that? Why would we want to keep the, the, uh, uh, the police ignorant of uh, the name, photograph, and current address of drivers upon the streets? What exactly is the question? I mean, I'm why would we not want to have a system where uh, uh, undocumented aliens uh, can be picked up for driving without a license? Why would we want to have a system where the police would be denied uh, access to a photograph, a current address, and the name of uh, the person? Well. We wouldn't be denied, you know, when, when someone who, right now, if someone was to get stopped and doesn't have a driver's license, 
If you do not have another identification, that officer has the right to take you in because he does not know who you are. With the driver's card, it has to go through the DMV. You have to prove who you are. Um, you know, if you get stopped with the driver's card and he says, uh, can I see your license and registration? And if you don't have a license and you have this driver card that we've been handing out, well, not handing out yet, obviously, have to, you know, go through um, the requirements and it, to be eligible to have one. But that police officer then has, you know, has enough to be like, well, you stopped, uh, you didn't correctly stop for this stop light, you ran this light, um, and then he can go f there from there, know who the person is, because at that point, because it's been through the DMV, and we know who you are, that that officer has the the right to do whatever he needs to do and and is, can pursue that. Is that a public good? Of course, of course. We we gotta we we gotta know who we are. You know, we gotta make sure that uh, everyone on the road is who they are, and we can identify who they are. I was under the impression that the enforcement of the immigration laws of the United States were up to agencies of the federal government. And I'm confused as to why the state of Oregon would be enforcing immigration law. Any comment of yours? I don't, I, not 100%. It's a, it's a backdoor method of enforcing immigration laws by requiring this, uh, uh, prohibiting people who are here who are illegally from obtaining a driver's license uh, to my opinion, it has nothing to do with safety. It's just enforcing immigration law, and that's why I'm confused as to why it would even be legal. I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle the safety part because I feel like this is the biggest thing. Um, if someone gets hit by someone that isn't insured and doesn't have a driver's license and doesn't know how to drive, it comes back to the person that was hit. Because if you you don't you don't have insurance, so insurance won't be el won't be able to pay for your damage. So at the end of the day, it's gonna come out of your pocket. You know, if you have a 2015 new suburban, and that baby gets hit and it's destroyed, no one's gonna pay for it. Insurance isn't gonna pay for it, and the person probably isn't gonna pay for it because they don't have insurance. So it, at the end of the day, it's gonna come back to your wallet and. And I feel like this is going to be a step forward into equity, into public safety. And, you know, we'll, we'll leave the national level with the immigration because they have to step up to their plate and actually tackle that. You know, we're just doing it at a, we're trying to get this Measure 88 passed at a state level. Thank you. Myra, I think those were classified as friendly questions, even though we're put in a very formal manner. Um, again, I'm John Tyner, president of the Washington County, excuse me, don't bite teeth through the mail. I'm John Tyner, president of the Washington County <laughs> Public Affairs Forum, and we're um, aired on uh, Comcast Channel 21 on TVCC, TV, Tualatin Valley Community Television. Uh, our program next week is the Senate District uh, 17, race between the incumbent and our challenger, um, and then we'll have some house races on there too. Uh, we have, not everyone.